Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There is two requests for dua. Number one is for Brother Fazul Haq, uh, who is recovering from a surgery. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him shifa and all those who are sick. Adhi bil ba'sa rabba nas, wa shfi anta shafi, la shifa illa shifa'uk, shifa an la yugadir wa saqma. Allahumma shfi maradana wa maradal muslimin, amin rabbil alameen. There is a second request, uh, and second dua request by Brother Fawad uh, Asadullah, who is requesting dua for the passing away of his brother overseas in Nalillahi wa inna ilayhi rajon. Actually, the name of the, no. Yeah, so the name of the disease is Shu'aybullah. Um, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him a place in Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten his grave. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him. And may Allah give the family of Sabr Jameen. Amin Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Ashhadu an la Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim In alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina man yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlil fala hadiya lahu wa nashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa nashhadu anna muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'd faqad qala Allah tabaarak wa ta'ala fi al-Qur'an al-Majid wa Furqan al-Hamid ba'da a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim Ya ayyuhal nasu taqoo rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhum 
هما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءل به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم نقيبا وقال تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوز عظيم صدق الله العظيم فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that just as He has gathered us here today on this day of Jum'ah, may Allah gather us along with our families in gentle firdas al-a'la, in the companionship of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our last a'mal, our best a'mal, and, he, and may He take us from, his, from this dunya when He is most pleased with us. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. As we approach the end of the Islamic lunar calendar, the month of the Hijjah is starting next week. It is the 10 days that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He swears upon these 10 days. He says, Fajr, ashr. He swears that these are the best 10 days. And not only that, but we find in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that there are no deeds that are performed that are better than the deeds that are performed in these 10 days. The first 10 days of the hijjah brothers and sisters, are right around the corner. And when we talk about the hijjah the very first thing that comes to our mind is Hajj. It is the month where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated that this is the month where Hajj will take place. This is the month where thousands and you know millions of people they go and they perform these the rituals, the manasik of Hajj, and they come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They fulfill an obligation of their deen. But before we even talk about Hajj. Before we talk about anything regarding the month of the Hijjah, there is no doubt in the fact that the month of the Hijjah is also the month where we revive the legacy of our forefather Ibrahim alayhi salam. This 10th day of the Hijjah that will be coming up soon, and inshallah I'll be talking about this more, that this, on this day, the sacrifice that we perform, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he referred to it as, هَذِهِ سُنَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ Ibrahim. That this is the sunnah of your father, Ibrahim alayhi salam. There is no way we can approach the month of the Hijjah without going back and learning from the stories of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And what an amazing figure he was first of all he was from the Ulul Azam prophets not only that but he is such a figure in society in history that not only do Muslims have in enormous amount of reverence and respect for but other religions have a great deal of respect for Ibrahim Islam there may be differences there may be disagreements as to who comes after that and who was a prophet and who and who was not a prophet but there is no disagreement amongst the the, the the, the Christian faith, the Judaic faith, and the Islamic faith, that Ibrahim السلام, was a revered figure. And why was he such a revered figure? Because he gave himself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First of all is, he is the only one who said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to convey his salams to us. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went for Isra in Mi'raj, and on the seventh sky, he met Ibrahim alayhi salam. And at that time, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, convey my salams to your people. He was the only prophet to say that and that is why till today, till today, until the day of judgment, whenever we send our peace and blessings upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we send our peace and blessings upon not only Ibrahim alayhi salam, but the al and the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Ibrahim alayhi salam is that kind of figure that this is where the history of Bani Israel starts from. If you want to study Bani Israel and the history of Bani Israel, you go back all the way to the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And when we study the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam, he is a man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again and again, he referred to him as Hanifan. And one of the meanings of Hanifan is that no matter what is the challenge, no matter what the trial is, 
that this is a man whose focus is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My focus is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no challenge will come between me and pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's talk about today two important lessons from the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Not only the individual accomplishments of Ibrahim alayhi salam, because the Quran does talk about his story before he had a family and the Quran talks about his, uh, his story after he had a family. Today inshallah in this brief khutbah I just want to share just few lessons that we can learn from the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. and the reason why I chose this subject is because many times today as families we are struggling in different capacities and today inshallah I just want to just share a few things that we can perhaps apply in our life the very first thing that we learn when it comes to our deen when it comes to the deen of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam not only do we see the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam doing this but we saw Ibrahim alayhi salam doing this and that is that that sacrifices are going to be required not only for one person in the family but sacrifices are going to be required from everyone in the family. First of all is we learn that we have to make sacrifices when it comes to the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here we find Ibrahim alayhi salam. He is being told that go and sacrifice your son. He never said that, you know what, perhaps this was a one-off dream. Let me wait another day. No. It was, the, it was their belief and it's our belief that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or when they see a dream, it is a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he puts, he puts this in his dream. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs him that this is what I want you to do, then that is it. We, we learn that no matter how much he is close to his son, he is far from his son, he is away from his son, and it is a known fact that when you are away from your family, you can wait to see your family, and especially when it comes to a mother, when it comes to a father, when they are away from their kids, subhanAllah, Allah has put so much love in their heart that they cannot wait to see their kids again. It's just human nature and how we are, that when we are around our kids all the time, we can't sometimes way to get away from them but as soon as we get away from them we just want to come back to them and hold them and hug them and so forth think about Ibrahim alayhi salam he's away his son is growing up he can't wait to see his son and imagine now coming to his son and saying that this is what is being required of me and think about we know that Ibrahim alayhi salam nothing's gonna get in between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he doesn't need to necessarily even consult with his son but he does it because the Quran wants to highlight the religiosity of Ismail alayhi salam. He could have come to him and say, you know what, this is what's going to happen, whether you like it or not, deal with it. This is what Allah told me to do. But no, he tells his son, فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا tara." That what do you think it is? What is your opinion about this? And Ismail alayhi salam, he knows that this is going to be difficult. He knows that I'm going to have to give up my life. What did he say at the end? He says, سَتَجِدُنِي إِنْشَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ Sabr comes after affliction. Sabr comes after pain. He understands that this is going to be difficult upon my father. This is going to be difficult upon me I also as a child to just sit there and let my, my father sacrifice me. He understands that there's going to be pain involved. He understands what he's about to go through. But he tells his father, I will be inshallah from those who are patient. Satajiduni insha'Allah min al-sabirin. So when it comes to us and our families, brothers and sisters, and not only that, but Hajar alayhi salam, how much sacrifices that she had to go through? How many times today it's natural, there's nothing wrong, but a, a woman asking her husband, a wife asking her husband that why would you put us in this kind of situation? Put us in a place where we can survive, put us in a community that we can survive, where we have many people around us. And that place, there's no one there. In that place, there's no sign of life. How would a person survive over there? But she made a sacrifice. She realized that this is the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And never once did she say, why did Allah do this? So there were sacrifices made on behalf of everyone in the family. 
made on behalf of everyone in the family. And that is why, subhanAllah, when you and I, when we go for Hajj, when you and I, we go for Umrah, these sacrifices were so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our Hajj and our Umrah are not done without, without fulfilling the sunnahs and, the, and reviving the legacy and the practices of not only Ibrahim alayhi salam, but the entire family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When a person comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has to be a collective effort. So this is why one of the most important things that we have to teach our children going forward is that there will always be sacrifices that have to be made in order to uphold your deen. Now one thing I do want to make this very clear. You know a lot of time as parents, we try to, understand, we try to explain our kids the logic behind the sacrifices. And you have to understand as parents that not all the time will our kids understand the logic behind every single thing in life. You tell your children, I'm telling you to do so, you do it, whether you understand it or not, but I'm your father, I'm your mother, I understand what's better for you and what's not better for you. And today we do live in a time, you know, where, you know, at one time kids would, you know, parents would say something, the kids would do it, no questions asked. But we do live in a time where kids are always asking, why? 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 It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. Well, at the same time, as parents, we don't have to always necessarily explain the logic behind every single thing. We tell them that this is what we're telling you to do. Whether you understand the hikmah of it now or not, but it does not mean that you don't have to do it. You must do it. So we teach our kids. And later on, inshallah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help them understand the logic. How many times even us as children, how many times we never understood the logic of anything we were told to do? But we did it. But later on, when we grew up, when maturity kicked in, when, you know, when we became more intelligent in life, when we understood life more, we then understood that why my parents told me to do so. Why did such and such person tell me to do so? What is the hikmah behind this? You know, we never understood it. But that's why, even when it comes to our children, they may ask questions, but we have to always explain to them that when it comes to your deen, your deen is the most precious commodity that you have. More than this dunya, this deen is the most important thing. And when it is the most important thing, when it is the most precious thing, you take care of it the most. When you have a diamond, you don't go to a diamond store and the diamond is sitting out in public. No, that diamond is sitting behind the glass and there's lasers and there's so many means of security over there. Why? Because it is so precious. Likewise, when it comes to our deen, that deen is more precious than that diamond. That deen is the most important thing that we have in this dunya. Without this deen, there is no entry into, into, the, into the jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whenever time calls for, then we will make sacrifices. And when the parents make sacrifices, then the children, they learn from the parents and then they will also make sacrifices. So we have to always teach our children though no matter what, yes, there are going to be times where this is a situation in our family, but it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Upon this decision, of Allah, we are patient. When it comes to maintaining our deen and holding on our deen, well, there will sometimes be sacrifices required from us. And not only that, but when you love something that you love so much, but if it is against the teachings of our deen, then you have to leave it. We have to teach our kids that no matter what you love, if there is something that Allah loves most, we have to adopt that and we have to give up what we love over what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, loves. The next thing that we learn from this family of Ibrahim Islam is the importance of the religious, the religiosity of the future of our kids. We have to be just like today. You know, subhanAllah, you talk to some parents and when their family is expecting a child, many times they say, what, do, what would you want? And many times parents say, I want a boy. And why do you want a boy so much? Because when I get old, and when my wife get old, and we can live with our boy, the girls have to get, you know, they have to depart, they have to leave the family eventually one day. But, you know, the boys become like an insurance plan for the parents, okay, a lot of times. So the parents are worried that at least we can live with our child, or at least we can live with someone, someone's going to be there for us, right? There's nothing wrong in being worried about the future. There's nothing wrong in looking into the future. But what's wrong is when the future is only about dunya, and that there is no consideration for the future from a religious point of view. It is very important that when we talk about our kids 
and we talk about their future, we have to include the conversation of religion into that. We have to do whatever we can to ensure that the religion is protected within our children. Let me explain from the story of Ibrahim Islam. Ibrahim Islam comes to Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Rab, um, Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyyati biwadin ghayri thi zar'in inda baytika al-muharram. Here he understands that it's not only my sacrifice, it's everyone's sacrifice. And that's why he referred to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Rabbana, O oh, our Lord. Before that he says what? Rabbi, my Lord. Now here in this ayah, because everyone's making a sacrifice, he's saying Rabbana, our Lord. Rabbana inni askantu min dhuriyyati. We're living in a place that is barren. As I said earlier, no people, no civilization, no population, no community, and there is no source of life. So he leaves his family there, and he goes. Surah Baqarah says, رَبِّ جَعَلْ هَذَا بَلَدًا آمِنًا وَرُزُقَ أَهْلَهُ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ Okay? He says that, Ya Allah, protect my family, and give risk to this, to this, to this city. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that many years later, now that Ibrahim alayhi salam comes, the well of Zamzam has been discovered. And if you know anything about the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu you know that there were certain tribes like Jurhum and then Khuza'ah, they came and they lived next to the, next to the Kaaba because the source of life was there. Water was there. At that time, water was a, water was a luxury. So when people saw that the water was existing in Mecca, they moved to Mecca and a population and a community grew and developed around the Kaaba. Now at that time, Ibrahim Islam he comes back and he sees that, you know, there's, you know, mashallah, rizq over here, and this place is safe here also. My wife is living over here, my child is living over here, everything is safe. At that time, what dua did he make? Now he never asked for more dunya. Now this time he says in Surah Ibrahim, Rabbi ja'al hadhal balada amina, wajnubni, oh Allah, keep the city safe. Wajnubni wa baniya an na'bud al-asnam. At that time, the key fitna at that time was worshipping idols. It was something that was everywhere. So here Ibrahim Aliyah understands that this is a fitna of his time. He's saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, protect my, me and my children. He's worried about the, fu- the religious future of his children. So he says that, Ya Allah, protect me and my family from worshipping idols. Now, how do we understand that in our context? We have to keep a close eye on all the fitnas that are going on. You cannot be oblivious of what is going on in society. If you think that you're just going to put your head under the rug and ignore the entire society and all the fitnas that are going on, you're not going to be able to. Okay? Because there's the, these fitnas are, are everywhere around us. And it's not like it's outside the house. It's inside the house. When you talk about social media, when you talk about all these other things, they're inside our house. So, we have to understand that this is the fitna of our time. Just like at that time, worshipping idols was a fitna at that time, today we have many other fitnas. And we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the protection of our children and our future generation from these kind of fitnas. So this is the very first thing that we learn from Ibrahim alayhi salam. Then he's also asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that not only for himself, he's asking for his children. See, what happens many times in our families is that this is something very common that you begin to see is that in our families, it's not only about the religiosity of one person. See, Ibrahim alayhi salam is a prophet of Allah. He could say that, you know what, my family is not anywhere close to deen or they probably are close to deen, but I'm the prophet of Allah. I need to be worried about my own religion. No, he's saying, I need to be worried about the religion of my entire family. So what's important to understand in our current day is that today we have families where sometimes the father, it becomes, he becomes so religious that this becomes pressuring upon the entire family. He begins to look down on the entire family. And it's the opposite also that there are many families where the wife becomes very religious. They're attending classes and watching lectures and there's a, such a, a religious shift in their life. And what happens is that when the entire family is not on the same page, What's happening is that there's a disconnect internally being created. Because see, religion, what it does is that it does create ego at a time. Okay? When shaitan, he was the most knowledgeable of everyone at that time amongst the malaika. But that caused him to, be, to express his ego. And he said, I will not make sense that to Adam alayhi salam. Knowledge does have that thing. And that is why 
Every single time when we talk about knowledge, when we talk about deen and so forth, we always talk about ikhlas. We always talk about making sure that E goes out of the picture. So we're talking about here that a person is so religious in the family that they begin to look down on the others. They feel like that I am the most superior in the entire family. And subhanAllah, I will say this without any reservation, that the most dysfunctional families in our society, in our community, are usually the most religious ones. I'm being very frank with you. The one you'll find many families that where there's so much religion, where people outside look at them and they say, mashallah, what a great religious family. When you look at that kind of family, internally they are the most dysfunctional. You know why? Because deen was used. Because one person was becoming religious and everyone else was behind. What we learn from Ibrahim salam is that we have to take our entire family together. That means that if I have to take one or two steps back and I have to take my entire family with me and grow with my entire family religiously, that is better than a person individually becoming so religious that then there is a conflict in the family. And this usually happens. That is why we learn also from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he, he, he was the Prophet of Allah. Aisha radiallahu anha was not the Prophet of Allah. But the Prophet sallam ever say anything derogatory to her? Did the Prophet sallam ever say anything in a way sent, you know, that you could sense that perhaps Rasulullah sallam is, is expressing his superiority because of his religion over Aisha? Never. Religion was given. Religion that we have is to make us more humble. Religion has been given to us to grow our akhlaq. Religion has been given to us so that we care for others. So if I see as a husband, if I see that my wife is not probably at my level, it doesn't mean that I should look down on her. It doesn't mean that I should say derogatory remarks to her, but it means that we work together as a team. That is what's so special about the family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. They worked together as a team and they came closer as a team to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what's so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's more harder? I ask you, what's more harder? To individually come close to Allah or as a family coming close to Allah? It is, it is without a doubt that the, it's more difficult and more challenging as a family to come close to Allah. Someone wants to move ahead so fast, but your family is moving along very slowly and gradually. That's fine. Rasulullah he would go and he would sometimes throw water. Not pour water, okay? Don't do that to your family. He would just sometimes take some water on the, on the face of Aisha. Sometimes Aisha would wake up. Sometimes Aisha would not wake up, radiallahu anha, our mother. Sometimes she would wake up and the Prophet and her would have a chit chat, you know. I mean, look at this is what religion is supposed to do to us versus what religion has done to us today. So this is why what we learn from the family of Ibrahim Islam is that it's not about individual religiosity. But it's about collective religiosity. If I see that my kids, they're struggling in their iman. And yes, my iman is there as a father or as a mother, but my kids are here, then be patient. Sit down with them, show them love, keep on pushing them slowly and gradually, slowly and gradually, inshallah one day they will get there. Yes, it requires patience. Yes, it requires patience. When you sit down with your child today, you try to explain to them the rewards of salat. For many of them, they're like, it's irrelevant for me. It, I, I don't understand what's so great about it. Because for them, they have always been used to seeing results on the spot. When it comes to our deen, we don't see the results on the spot. We see the reward in the hereafter. That's why sometimes it can become challenging for many people to do what is right. Because I don't see the instant results. So that is why we have to sit down as a family and think as a family. And yes, if the mother and father, they feel that, okay, we can move forward. And inshallah, slowly and gradually, we'll bring our kids along too. That's fine. Every single family is different. But you sit down with your family. Sit down with your wife. Sit down with your husband and discuss this. If one is excelling, take a step back or two. It doesn't mean that you in your individual worship, you, 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 uh, you take a step back. In your individual worship, keep on moving forward. But as a family, as a family, you may have to take a step back one or two and then bring the entire family. I'll say this in Urdu. Uh, probably you may understand when I say this in Urdu, but there's a concept, sabko lekar chalna. What that means is that you take everyone with you. You move forward, that's not a family. So this is why these are just two things. And I'll finish on this. There's a dua in Surah Al-Baqarah 
that you and I, we should learn this, memorize it, and recite it every single day. It was a dua that Ibrahim made for his children. Ayah number 128 of Surah Al-Baqarah. رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ O oh Allah, رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ O oh Allah, make us from amongst Muslims for you. Is Ibrahim already a Muslim? Of course. But what he's basically saying is, O oh Allah, keep us steadfast upon this. Shaitan is with us. Shaitan is always going to try to deceive us. But O oh Allah, keep us steadfast upon this deen. Rabbana waj'alna muslimini laka. Wa min dhurriyatina. And not only me and my wife. Wa min dhurriyatina. Our upcoming generations. Ummatan muslimatan lak. An ummah that is subservient to you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa adina manasikana. The word manasik is usually in, in, in reference to hajj, the manasik of hajj. But there are many ulama, they say that this manasik here is in reference to how to do every single thing. Just like we say manasik ul hajj. How to do hajj? Manasika, manasikana on a broader perspective means how to do every single thing in life. How do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is a dua. وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا And in this process, there will be some shortcomings. In this process of coming close to you, we may fall short. وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا And we seek repentance from you, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a dua that you and I, we should memorize and make this dua every single day because it doesn't only include ourselves, it includes our upcoming generations. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to learn from the stories of Ibrahim alayhi salam and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us in our future generations ameen rabbil alamin barakallahu lana wa lakum fil qur'an azim wa nafa'ana wa iyyakum bi ayatihi wa dhikri hakim astaghfirullaha li wa lakum wa li sa'il muslimin fastaghfiru innahu huwal ghafurur rahim bismillahir rahmanir rahim in alhamdulillah nahmiduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina man yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlil fala hadiya lahu wa nashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa nashhadu anna muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'd faqad qala Allahu tabaraka wa ta'ala fi al-Qur'an al-Majid wa fi al-Qur'an al-Hamid ba'd a'udhu billahi min shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna 'ala an-nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu 'alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli 'ala Muhammad wa 'ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita 'ala Ibrahim وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين في كل مكان اللهم انصرنا على من خالفنا واحفظ بلادنا وأصلح أولادنا واشف مرضانا وعاف مبتلانا وارحم موتانا وخذ بيدينا إلى كل خير وعاصمنا من كل شر واحفظنا من كل ضير اللهم قسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن يقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقواتنا ما حيتنا وجعله الوارث منا وجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا وانصرنا على من عادانا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا ولا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا اللهم إنا نسلك علما نافعا وعملا متقبلا ورزقا واسعا وشفاء من كل دا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن نفس لا تشبع ومن دعاء لا يستجاب اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين اللهم ارحم موتانا ومرضى المسلمين آمين رب العالمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروني أذكركم واشكروني ولا تكفلون أقيم الصلاة <clears throat> Straight lines filling the gaps. There's a lot of space inside uh, the brothers in the back two rooms. Please come inside the main hall. There's plenty of space. And if you feel that you have to stand inside the back two rooms, please make sure the rows are complete. Often, the rows are incomplete. 
الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خلال الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل أعوذ برب الفلق من شر ما خلق ومن شر غاسق إذا وقب ومن شر النفاثات في العقد ومن شر حاسد إذا حسد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين قل أعوذ برب الناس ملك الناس إله الناس من شر الوسواس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله